The 17th and early 18th centuries saw one of the darkest periods in Scotland's history when the witch hunts took place. Men, but mostly women, were accused of witchcraft and sorcery, conversing with the devil, making neighbours and animals sick, and even causing death. The town of Forfar and Angus didn't escape these hunts, and although it's recorded around 42 people were accused, the number could be much higher. The first alleged witch to be executed in the town was Griselle Simpson. She was placed in the old Tollbooth prison following a short time in the parish church steeple, where she was watched constantly, so candles had to be bought for those keeping an eye on her. What was unusual was that the male prisoners, including murderers, weren't watched in the same way as Griselle. This watching and waking of women accused of witchcraft was a form of torture. During her incarceration, the windows of the toll booth were closed so that she was kept in the dark, but she wasn't allowed to sleep, the watcher making sure of that, and she wasn't even allowed a fire to keep her warm at night. Shortly before her execution, Forfar Town Council paid 15 shillings for a length of rope for the letting down of Griselle Simpson at the high window of the toll booth. However, there is no record of any trial for her, so was this a lynching. Following her death on 19th August 1661, the Town Council paid six shillings for a grave for her in what was known as the Playfield, but she wasn't buried that day. Instead, on Sunday 8th September, two men were sent to get her parents to bury her. So where was her body during this time? A week after Griselle's burial, another Forfar woman stood accused of being a witch. She was Isabel Shirey, who confessed that she was in league with the devil. Confessions were usually drawn out by the local parish minister, Alexander Robertson, who visited the accused while incarcerated, along with several notable men from the area. These were usually the bailey, the town clerk, the provost, councillors and local landowners. Many of the accused suffered at the hands of their confessors. Often they were tortured in order that a confession could be obtained. Isabel's confession was taken down in between the two Sunday sermons, stating she'd met the devil the previous month near Forfar Loch. She then named other locals who'd been present. These were John Taylor, Helen Guthrie, Mary Rind, Elspeth Alexander, Janet Stout and Janet Howitt, Helen Guthrie's 13-year-old daughter. In her statement, she claimed that she and the devil had conspired to kill a man called George Wood, a local bailey, by braying to powder two toads' heads and one piece of one dead man's skull, and one piece dead man's flesh, which the devil perfumed. It was known that she'd quarrelled with the bailey. A pan had been removed from her house in lieu of an unpaid local tax. She said that when he had visited her, she had poured the powder into his drink, and he'd consequently died. Isabel faced trial in November 1661. On the 21st and 23rd, she was brought before her judges, Patrick Cairn Cross of Balmashanor, David Hunter of Burnside, Thomas Hunter of Restenneth, Gideon Guthrie of Hulkerton, Sheriff Deputy Alexander Guthrie of Carsbank, local landowners and magistrates, as well as the provost Alexander Scott, Bailey David Dixon and Bailey Thomas Guthrie. She was found guilty of the abominable crime of witchcraft. Rope was purchased for the strangling of Isabel Shirey and drawing her through the fire. 
the council paid 12 shillings for that and another 16 shillings for one tar barrel, often used to burn the body rather than actually tarring the witch alive. Two days after Isabel's confession, Elspeth Alexander and Janet Stout had their confessions extracted. Elspeth was married to John Moffat and confessed that she'd attended a meeting of witches at Petterden three and a half years previously, where Isabel, Helen, the two Janets and John had also attended. It was during this meeting that all of them received their devil's mark from Old Nick himself. They were also given new names at this meeting. Elspeth was given the name Alison, Isabel the Horse, Helen the White Witch, and Janet Howitt became the Pretty Dancer. John was given the name Beelzebub. However, Janet Stout, for some reason, had forgotten the name she'd been given. To the interrogators, this meant one thing. They had renounced their baptism and Christianity and had instead made a covenant with the devil. Elspeth and Janet Stout went on to admit to another meeting a month later at Murie Nows, where Janet served ale to those assembled as they ate with the devil. A third meeting was said to have been held in nearby Kerry Muir when Mary Rind was also welcomed into the coven and given the name Devil's Daughter. On 17th December 1661, Helen Cuthel, Helen Guthrie, Elspeth Alexander and Isabel Smith appeared, although Helen Guthrie's trial didn't take place until the following year. The same men were present. That same day, Janet Stout and Janet Howard had their confessions reaffirmed. Janet Howard confessed that she was initiated on the inch in Farfar Loch. She stated Isabel Shirey had introduced her to the devil and confirmed the meeting at Mury Nows. She said at the meeting the devil had kissed her and nipped her on the shoulder, causing her some pain, until she next saw him six weeks later when he nipped her again at the same point and the pain disappeared. She also said that she'd seen her mother having sex with a man all dressed in black, whom she believed to be the devil. At a meeting of the town council on 17th December, the watch on the accused was changed. Instead of six men watching, three would now do that in the upper toll booth, making sure they checked them every three hours, stopping the accused from sleeping. Bearing in mind this was December, all the candles were removed and the fires weren't to be lit, forcing the prisoners to live in horrific conditions. The central person to all of this was Helen Guthrie, wife of James Howard. She confessed on 25th September 1661 that she was a very drunkensome woman, a terrible cursor, and had led a wicked life. She told the presbytery that she'd been a witch for 14 years, having learned sorcery from Janet Galloway in Kerry Muir, and was proud of the fact that her curses worked on those who crossed her. She believed she could tell a witch by supernatural powers and blood on a paper, and she threatened the minister that if he took these papers from her, then the whole borough would suffer. She named around 30 of the 42 or so suspects and stated that Janet Stout had harmed John Cooper and that John Taylor had hurt Andrew Watson. She also claimed that the devil had tried to rescue her from her prison on 15 September instant, about midnight. She said he'd picked her up off the ground by three or four feet, but that the night watchmen had struck at her with their swords and did prevent it. The three men corroborated her story that this was what had happened that night. Janet's daughter was also imprisoned 
simply for being her daughter. If she was a witch, then surely Janet would be too. On 28th October 1661, Helen went on to name other witches. These included Elspeth Bruce from Cortochy, who'd asked the devil for help to find out who'd stolen cloth from her, Isabel Smith, Catherine Wallace, George Ellis and Andrew Watson. She also stated she'd killed her six-year-old half-sister, Margaret Hutchison. She stated that in around 1658, she and ten other witches had danced in Farfar Kirkyard, with the ground being lit up by fireflies. George Ellis and Isabel Shirey, she said, had sung songs in the presence of the devil, who was in the shape of a black iron-hued man. That night, she said, they had desecrated a grave of an unbaptized child, with Watson cutting off the feet, hands and buttocks, and making them into a pie. The year after this, they were joined by Helen Alexander, Isabel Smith and Catherine Wallace, but were disturbed, so fled. At midnight they met again and made their way to Mary Rin's house, where they ate, with the devil being guest of honour. Some of them visited brewer John Binney, but he wasn't too happy about being disturbed after midnight, so sent them packing. Alexander Hay supplied them with whisky instead. Hay has his own story. It was Hay who hired noted witchfinder John Kincaid. He became notorious in East Lothian as being a witch pricker, that is, the man who found the devil's mark on the bodies of accused witches. This was said to be a blemish or mark. Even birthmarks were targeted on the skin that would feel no pain and when pricked would release no blood. The suspect would be stripped to the waist or even completely in some cases, her hair shaved off and she would stand in front of a panel of men while she was pricked all over her body with a long thin iron pin forced deeply into her skin. Kincaid was brought up to Forfar from Trenent in September 1661 and prodded widow Catherine Porter, an old blind woman, and Kristen White. Catherine was poked with two preens, as they were known, newly purchased for Kincaid's use. These iron preens were three inches long and forced up to their necks into the old woman in order to find the devil's mark. The zealousness of Kincaid in carrying out this task can't be underestimated, especially when you consider he was paid for each pricking he undertook. The more riches he discovered, the more he was paid. He apparently did his work so well that he was made a freeman of the borough of Forfar, but just six months later he fell out of favour and found himself in the old toll booth in Edinburgh accused of great abuses, whereby, in all probability, many innocents suffered. If pricking, waking, and being kept in horrendous conditions didn't force a confession, the branks were pulled out. This was a small iron band with a barb that was placed in the mouth. It was attached to a wall by a short chain, meaning the suspect could neither sleep nor speak. It also stopped them from drinking, and it was believed only a thirsty witch would confess. Once Elspeth Bruce, Janet Stout and Helen managed to demolish the Cortachy Bridge by pushing against it with their shoulders. A strong wind whipped up and broke the wooden boards on the bridge. A week before St James's Day in 1660, she, Isabel Shirey and Elspeth Alexander met at a tavern in Barry, along with three other women and the devil, 
who she said was in the shape of a horse. They wrecked a ship in Carnoustie Bay. She also told her accusers that John Taylor had once turned himself into a pig and she'd seen him destroying the corn in a field belonging to William Mills, a miller. However, Taylor only confessed to seeing the devil at Halkerton, where he offered to lend him money, but Taylor refused. He said the devil appeared again at Petterden, but again he refused to have anything to do with him. In June of 1662, Forfar Town Council ordered that Helen and her daughter Janet be placed in the stocks, or that the window of their cell be nailed shut, preventing them from looking out of the window hereafter. In November 1662, Helen Guthrie's trial got underway before Sheriff Deputy James Keith, Alexander Guthrie, Gideon Guthrie, Thomas Hunter of Burnside and a Mr Thompson, as well as the Provost and Baileys. She was found guilty and executed on Friday 14th November by James Bruce of Montrose. She was the last person to be executed for witchcraft in Forfar. As for her daughter Janet, she remained in prison until she was 18 years old and was likely banished from Forfar, but her fate is unknown. Helen Alexander and Mary Rind were released from prison in April 1663, but were banished from the town. Elspeth Bruce, Helen Cuthill, Isabel Smith and Elspeth Alexander were all executed in 1662. In all, around 22 women were executed in Forfar for witchcraft. They were just ordinary people living ordinary lives at the wrong time. Where the bodies of the witches were buried was near the public washing green and the stake where they'd lost their lives. Many of their bones have since been dug up thanks to the industrialisation of the town. But there remains one more question. Who was behind the Forfar witch hunts? The answer lies with the local minister at the time, Alexander Robertson. However, his overzealousness in finding witches saw his downfall and he was removed as minister by the Privy Council in 1662. Immediately following this, the witch hunts ceased. Forfar remembers its witches with a memorial by the banks of Forfar Loch. If you enjoyed this episode of Scotland's History, please like, comment and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching.